Thanks for having our paper on the program. So this is joint work with Fabrizio Zilibotio. Fabrizio and I have been interested for some time in uh, preference transmission, uh, in particular with an uh, eye to uh, uh, trying to understand uh, differences, say, in cultural preference across different groups of people or perhaps different countries and how that relates to uh, economic development. The first models we wrote down uh, were models where the motive for preference transmission was entirely altruistic, meaning you like your children and you, uh, you endow them with certain values or certain attitudes or certain preferences in order to maximize their happiness in some sense. Okay? And that's, uh, I think it's an important motive, but if you kind of introspect a bit about um, you know, how we think about uh, our children, uh, I think it's kind of important that there's both altruistic and paternalistic motives. So there are certain things where parents and children may uh, disagree, but you still, uh, you're happy with uh, supporting whatever preference your child has. You know, my kids like to watch uh, Dora the Explorer. Perhaps, I, you know, I, I like it less, but you're still kind of uh, happy to uh, adopt that preference. You know, but then there's other issues where you might disagree a bit more. So last year we were watching the European uh, soccer tournament, uh, Germany against Italy, and then my son told me that he wants the blue team to win. And then I made it very clear that if he wants the blue team to win, he can't stay in our house and live with us anymore. And uh, so that was kind of an example of, of paternalism, where we have views that are different, and we kind of want to shape the preferences of our children uh, to be more like our own. And so, so we start to write down uh, kind of models that uh, combine altruism and paternalism to kind of understand under which condition, uh, which force is more important, or kind of what er uh, features of the data could be explained by either one. And what this leads you to is a theory of parenting styles. So it's going to be a theory of preference transmission with both altruistic and paternalistic motives. And then uh, something as a parenting style comes out uh, as an uh, uh, outcome of this. And we have to think about how we can relate this to uh, kind of various features of the data. So what do you mean by parenting styles? Uh, so here's... Um, not here, but this thing, I guess I have to stand here. So here's some, uh, just, uh, some representative of parenting styles, uh, Pink Floyd, um, Maria Montessori, and Amy Chua was already mentioned uh, uh, previously with her very uh, highly skilled uh, daughters. So who are these people? What uh, do they have to do with parenting? Uh, Pink Floyd, uh, another brick in the wall, kind of, uh, kind of a statement of the uh, anti-authoritarian parenting paradigm from the, uh, I guess, 1970s. We don't need no education, we don't need no thought control, no dark sarcasm in the classroom. Hey, teacher, leave them kids alone. So that was uh, kind of a phase where the idea was you leave your uh, children pretty much on their own. That's the best, best way to uh, bring, them, uh, bring them up. There's views that are uh, taking a somewhat different view, but uh, still, I guess, somewhat mild-mannered. So Maria Montessori, for example, is an uh, example for a parenting uh, philosophy that uh, uh, does uh, appreciate the idea of freedom for kids, but within limits. So the idea is there are certain things the uh, kids have to be led to at different phases of development. And so it's, uh, it's freedom within limits. It's kind of a form of guided uh, development. And then finally, there's uh, Amy Chua, the tiger mom, already mentioned in the previous talk. So Amy Chua, uh, I, you know, those of you who live in America know all about this. Uh, those of you who don't may not. So Amy Chua wrote this book about uh, Chinese parenting, trying to explain American parents why Chinese parenting is, is much, much better than the American way of, uh, of parenting. And so so she, uh, uh, she tells us how uh, Chinese parents raise uh, very successful uh, children, and then she kind of tells you how to do this. And the way to do this is, uh, is a style that's very authoritarian. It sets very strict limits uh, for the kids. So here's kind of a list of things that her two daughters uh, from the picture before were never allowed to do. They were never allowed to attend a sleepover, no play dates uh, during childhood, never watch TV or play computer games. Uh, you can't choose anything you want to do outside of school. You're not allowed to be uh, not the best student in every subject, with the exception of uh, German drama, where you're punished if you are the best student, because that's, uh, that's kind of a bad thing. And you're not allowed to play uh, uh, any instrument um, other than the piano or the violin but you have to play, play those two things. So it's kind of a very, very strict uh, mode of parenting, and she kind of argues that's how you have success, and that has uh, kind of led to a lot of anxiety, I guess, among American parents, whether maybe this is what we should all be adopting. So nowadays, nowadays we kind of uh, um, identify this uh, 
uh, tiger mom idea with uh, Chinese or kind of more widely Asian parenting. But I do want to point out that, of course, the uh, idea of being authoritarian is, is not really unique to, to Asia. So in the, in the past, it was also very much an element of Western culture. And so, so if you look at the Bible, for example, there's a lot of uh, kind of recommendations that uh, physical punishment is, is, is a good idea. You know? So you should be uh, very strict with your children. And even uh, just a few years ago, kind of a more uh, liberal uh, Western philosophy also has this idea that uh, young children really need a lot of guidance. And so you have to kind of beat them to, uh, uh, to do the right thing. So this already kind of goes to this idea uh, that the paper is trying to uh, get at, that uh, parenting style is not really just a deep cultural feature, but ultimately uh, responds to perhaps uh, kind of uh, features of the economic environment. And the theory will then be kind of used to uh, try to understand why things are the way they are. So, so why is it now the Chinese that are very authoritarian? Why uh, did the Europeans uh, used to be the same way, but then somehow they changed and moved in a different direction? Um, okay, so um, parenting style is, of course, not uh, something uh, new, in particular in development psychology. This uh, is kind of a well established notion, and there's a kind of a typology uh, due to Baumbrand that is, uh, I think, dominant for analysis of uh, parenting styles in that, in that field. And, and so in, in uh, psychology, they distinguish uh, three parenting styles, and uh, we're going to relate our theory kind of to the same uh, broad uh, typology. And so these uh, styles are authoritarian parenting, where you set very strict limits uh, to your kids and perhaps use punishments. So this would be uh, kind of the tiger mom style. Then there's the authoritative uh, parenting style, kind of different here at the end of the word. So authoritative uh, essentially means that you uh, do have a kind of a view of what your kids uh, should be doing, but rather than just telling them uh, what they have to do, you kind of try to uh, nudge them by wanting this themselves. You kind of work harder on their preferences, uh, which uh, perhaps goes uh, a bit together with this Montessori ideas. And finally, there's permissive parenting, where essentially you leave uh, kids uh, to their own uh, uh, under their own control, they can decide what they want, and there's very little uh, um, interference from the sides uh, of the parents. Um, okay, so we have uh, some stuff why, why people might want to care about uh, uh, um, preferences. I guess in this group, uh, maybe less necessary to talk about this. The, the one thing I want to say is that um, when you write down a model of endogenous preferences, there's always kind of a question of uh, what's really the distinction between preferences and skills. You know, and uh, and I think often it's uh, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult to draw a line there because those can have very similar implications. You know, for example, when you think of uh, patients, which we have worked on before, um, and, and Becker and Mulligan have worked on this too, with, with patients, there's a question of whether you think of your patients as a deep preference parameter, something that's kind of in the hardware of your brain, or whether it's more a skill, namely a skill to kind of to imagine the future vividly and therefore give it more weight in your decisions. You know, so there's kind of uh, two different interpretations, and it's, uh, I, I think they're, for the most part, kind of uh, almost equivalent. So from this perspective, when we talk about preferences, uh, you should interpret this perhaps a bit more widely to also uh, uh, incorporate certain skills, non-cognitive skills, that might then also be important for, for success. And there's a lot of work you know, um, kind of connected to this group uh, showing that uh, non-cognitive skills of uh, various uh, types are important for uh, long-run economic success. There's also some recent empirical work that does show that um, the family environment uh, can be quite important for the transmission of preferences uh, and skills. Because, of course, in the background, there's always this nature versus nurture debate. Uh, you know, we, we will nurture to play some role, and I think there's some evidence for that. Um, okay, but let me just uh, briefly touch on the theoretical literature that, that, we, that we build on. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. yeah. What yeah. do you want to do? Here, here. Uh, we, we have one slide away from, from what we want to do. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> OK, good. Um, um, well, what we want to do is, is, is combine these two different things. So, so uh, we, are, we are building on uh, uh, models of preference transmission that are based on altruism versus, um, versus uh, paternalism. So Bizin and Verdier is kind of the uh, initial uh, paper on that. We're going to combine this with the idea of restricting uh, that restrictions on one's choice that might be optimal. So the uh, paper in this vein is uh, Gould and Pesendorfer, but we will apply to uh, parents uh, versus children. And then there's uh, you know, some existing models of parenting strategies, uh, one by Marco, who is uh, somewhere here. But I, you know, given the lack of time, I won't talk about that. So here's, uh, here's, what we, uh, here's what we do. So we're going to have a theory of uh, parenting in a dynastic framework. So it's going to be uh, parents and children linked in the usual uh, dynastic uh, way. Uh, and there's going to be a mix of altruistic and uh, paternalistic motives. There's going to be different ways that you can affect your children. Namely, you can affect your children by um, restricting their choices, so you can just uh, make the decisions for them, or you can shape their preferences you know, in order to either make them happy or uh, make them do what you wanted to do them in the, in the first place. 
So when we do this, uh, it's going to give us some uh, theory of parenting styles, where kind of what mode of parenting you're going to engage in depends on the economic environment. And so the idea is going to be to uh, kind of map what the economic environment uh, looks like and what kind of style of prefer uh, parenting you're going to have. Can you not, uh, mm -hmm. expand their choice set? Say again? You cannot expand their choice set? Well, th th there's kind of some, some initial maximum uh, choice set, which you can just uh, you leave it unconstrained, or you could uh, restrict it. Yes. Mm -hmm. No. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so so we'll see that in just a sec. Um, okay. But but that, that's kind of the uh, general idea. So so what I will do, I will first show you kind of a somewhat general model of this uh, how this idea of preference transmission is going to work. Then I'm going to uh, show you a very specific, very simple example where uh, endogenous patients is kind of the the main thing we're going to. Uh, is what we're going to focus on. I'll talk a bit about the implications of this, and I will probably not talk about risk aversion because of the uh, limitations of, uh, of time. Okay, so here's going to be the, uh, the uh, general idea of this, uh, of this, of this model. So this, uh, this hmm? model would have no, absolutely no concern for any observation. No, that, that we're going to get, get to that. Hmm? Yeah, so I was going to ask the same question. Are there going to be testable implications of your data? Yes, well, of course. I mean, uh, this is mostly a theory paper, but you know, of course, we ultimately want to link this to data. So I, I'll show you some. Uh, in fact, I have some, you know, graphs with actual data on there, but it's, it's going to be just a suggestive kind of, you know, uh, ideas where this might lead. But of course, there, there is micro data, such as the NSY and, and the British surveys too, that have parenting styles and a bunch of outcomes. The theory has implications for, for what we should see in the data, and that's going to be the next step in that in that in that research. I should say this is a you know this is not a completely done project. So this is. A, uh, the theory part, and, and I'll talk about where it leads in terms of uh, implications. Okay, so we're going to have a model uh, uh, which is dynastic. Every person will have uh, one child. You live through uh, uh, two uh, uh, adult periods, so, so young and old. Um, you might think of young as kind of adolescence. Uh, children intrinsically have different preferences uh, from adults, uh, and parents are paternalistic uh, towards children in, in young age. It's going to be somewhat important, at least from the uh, uh, theoretical perspective, that the paternalism uh, applies uh, towards uh, relatively uh, young children. And, and I'll talk a bit more about this, why we assume this. So, so parents have the choice of uh, uh, forming their child's preferences in some form. And once these preferences are, stick, uh, are formed, they're going to have uh, long-term consequences. So they're going to affect choices both in young and in, uh, and in old age. Just somehow, just have to stay here. Okay, so um, did I speak? Yeah. Skip on. Here we are. Okay, so uh, so A is going to be kind of a general uh, notion of a preference uh, parameter, uh, and that's going to be a state variable, uh, a, a state variable for the for the dynasty. So here's going to be what the value function for an old adult with uh, preferences A is uh, is going to look like. So your utility, given your uh, preferences, depends on uh, two things. It depends on your old utility, and this O is for uh, utility in an uh, old age, and depends on the utility you derive from your children, which I will get to in a sec. And, and we, we write the utility in old age here generally as a function of your uh, preferences A and some choice X that, that you have to make. Okay, think, think of X as uh, you know, any kind of economic choice variable. So then this uh, W thing here, that is the utility you derive from your children. This utility will, will depend on three things. It depends on your own preferences because uh, to the extent that you are paternalistic, you look through the uh, outcomes of your kid with your own eyes. It depends on the preferences A prime that you endow your child with and uh, on this object xy, which is the choice set for the child. So xy is, is some uh, range of options that the child has. So what is now this uh, w function, the um, utility from the kids? Um, it's uh, essentially a mixture of uh, altruism and uh, paternalism. So, so this uh, parameter lambda is going to be the weight on the uh, paternalistic uh, motive. So with uh, weight lambda, you're going to look at what your child does in young age through your own eyes. So this is the utility function of an old person. O, uh, and it has uh, your preference parameter A in here. And this uh, thing x, y of A prime uh, x, y, that is the choice that the uh, child takes. Okay? So it's, uh, it's looking at your child, but evaluating with, with your own uh, adult uh, preferences. Uh, but, but we also allow for some weight on altruism. So with weight 1 minus lambda, you are uh, altruistic towards the child. And so you look at the uh, outcome of the child through the eyes of the child, uh, him or herself. So this is the young utility function, and A prime is the, uh, is the preference that you have just uh, endowed your child with. So I am altruistic with respect to my daughter's true utility function, or a utility function I would want her to have? Uh, this, this is her true utility function. UY. So if it's as complex as hell, uh, she's loving as hell, 
Uh, yes, but only with weight, uh, with weight uh, one minus lambda. Right? So, 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 I, so my, my uh, appreciation for her is kind of a combination of her utility and my utility. Okay? And if she's very risk-loving, uh, well, I you know, have some appreciation for, uh, uh, for her wishes, but uh, I also place uh, some weight on my own views. Right? And, and the question is, which of, those, which of those elements is going to dominate? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, uh, there's not going to be an explicit life cycle element. Well, uh, this is just a two-period life cycle. Right? There's young, old, and then uh, a V of A prime, this last part here, is then the adult utility of the child. So it's a dynasty that keeps on living. But, but we assume that you're uh, uh, altruistic towards the old age utility. And the, the idea is that there's more kind of course for, you know, more, more, more scope of conflict in adolescence as opposed to uh, old age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's really what it is. It's kind of, uh, in a way, it's fairly standard, but it just has this mixture of uh, altruism and, uh, and paternalism. Now, um, uh, this choice in here, the xy choice, uh, what the child does, this is something that is chosen uh, by the child. You can't uh, control this uh, directly, or you can control it indirectly by limiting this uh, choice set. Okay, so this xy is whatever the child finds best from her perspective, and her utility is simply the young utility, uh, and then the continuation utility beta b uh, over, over here. Okay. So, so, so that's why there might be some conflict of interest, because what the child does may not necessarily what you uh, want, the child, uh, want the child to do. Um, yes, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you only, uh, you only uh, uh, conditions on, on, on the state variables. Okay, so, um, so to make this uh, simple, we're going to assume that there is some, uh, some utility, uh, some value of this utility vector uh, a lower bar, which is uh, giving you the highest possible utility. And this is really just to uh, make the discussion a little bit uh, uh, easier. So, so this uh, a, lower bar, uh, a lower bar is for any possible choice is going to give you the highest possible utility both in old age and in uh, and young age. And we do it this way because then um, that means that any deviations from a lower bar is going to make the child less happy. You know, so it kind of makes this trade-off uh, explicit between the happiness of the child and you getting the child to do what you want. Okay? So if you, can, uh, if you can make the child both happier and do more what you want, of course, there's no conflict. You, do, you always do that. So we kind of focus on the deviation uh, from that point. Okay, so now how are you going to uh, uh, affect the uh, choice of the child uh, in, in, in general? Well, you can uh, write down a first error condition, you know, if it's interior, for, uh, for the choice of a prime, for this, um, uh, for this uh, choice of the preference uh, vector. And then you have kind of uh, you know, a first order condition that looks like this. So there's some uh, marge utility that the child gets in old age. That, that's boring. And there's uh, these two parts here. So, uh, so the first part is kind of the, the uh, altruistic part. So there's uh, you know, some uh, uh, potential uh, benefit or cost uh, of changing um, uh, a prime in terms of the, uti the impact of the utility uh, on the child. You know, if I change a prime, the child might get more or less happy. And uh, if, if I move away from uh, a lower bar, this would be kind of a negative term. This would be a cost uh, of making your child unhappy. But there's going to be the second term over here that is the paternalistic uh, element. So here is um, uh, uh, here's the product of two terms. So uh, this uh, second term here is the derivative of um, the, um, the uh, utility function of the, of the parent. Um, with respect to the choice of the child. Okay? So this, uh, this element arises because if I change the preference uh, of the child, it might change the decisions. And if the decision that the child makes is not the one that optimizes my utility, then this is going to make me, uh, it's going to have some impact on my utility. Okay? So this is, uh, this is the, the impact uh, from uh, uh, getting the child to do something else. That's multiplied by the impact this choice in A prime uh, actually has uh, on the choice uh, of the child. Okay? So you can see here, that this uh, paternalistic motive is going to be present only if this uh, derivative of the choice of the child with respect to the preference of the child is, uh, isn't zero. Okay? If it's zero, then, well, uh, this thing uh, just drops out. There's nothing you can do to affect the child. And then all that's left is make the child as happy uh, as possible. So that's kind of the usual altruistic case. But if the uh, choice of the um, child responds to the preference, uh, then this element is going to be, uh, is going to be there. So, uh, so it's going to matter here if, uh, you know, how much uh, freedom of choice the child actually has. For example, if, uh, if I've already restricted the choice of the child to just a single thing and it has no choice whatsoever, this thing will just drop out. And there will be no further influence on preferences. Is it possible you lose differentiability through this interaction between the uh, child and the parent? Why would, I, why would that be the case? Well, if you make a small change in your, as a parent in your behavior, 
-hmm. and the child's response to that in, in, in a way that causes you, that would cause you in anticipation to make a larger change. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean like some second order thing, not, uh, I don't know yeah, yeah. Order or second order. I mean, just yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so this is you know this is just telling you uh, assuming this uh, first order condition does characterize the optimum, this is what it what it looks like. Uh, I, I think it's easier to talk about those in particular examples. So the examples we have done wouldn't have that problem, uh, but this is very general. So you know all kinds of things could happen in principle. Of course, it's also going to be a function of uh, how big this derivative is. You know the, the, the derivative of my utility with respect to the choice of the child. You know if uh, if we had the same utility. Right? If uh, uo was equal to uy and a prime was equal to a, then this derivative is, is going to be equal to zero because of the envelope uh, uh, condition. You know, then, then the optimizing child of the uh, uh, choice of the child would also set uh, the derivative of my utility with respect to the choice equal to zero, and that would draw away. Okay? So, th so the extent to which paternalism matters depends on uh, disagreement, uh, how much uh, do we disagree about what's, what's the right thing to do, and uh, freedom of choice. So the more the child can choose, the more this thing is going to be important. This is just a parameter, you know. So uh, you, you, could, you could, in principle, also think about those being transmitted. Uh, today, I'm just going to think of this as some, some fixed number. But in principle, lambda could depend on a itself, right? Yes. Mm? Big boy would have more like a lambda right. equal to zero. Yeah. Mm? No, you, you could, in principle, also think of, of lambda being uh, something that's trans trans transmitted. We, we didn't find it so kind of uh, essential for getting the basic trade off so we left it constant for here. So it's something you could do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, because the a here is uh, is fixed. That's my own preferences. Because I look uh, uh, at what the child does with my own eyes. Hmm? Yeah. Hmm? Right. So that's already a fixed number at this point. Okay. So that, this is the uh, this is the choice of this uh, preference parameter. Uh, of course, there's the uh, second dimension, which is which is the choice of the choice set. Okay. So uh, so the uh, parent can also choose the set from which the uh, child uh, chooses, and it does it in kind of some maximizing way. Now, of course, if this um, uh, if by choosing this uh, choice that you had kind of complete unrestricted choice and you could simply pick your uh, preferred um, your, 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 your bliss point, then you would just do that and you would be done with, with everything. But, but the, the idea is going to be that there might be some, uh, uh, some trade-offs uh, uh, kind of in the set of the feasible uh, uh, choice sets. Okay? So by, uh, by restricting the choice set of the child, you might make it more difficult for the child, for example, to, to react to uh, future changes. Okay, and uh, I'm going to make this a bit more explicit in a second what this is going to look like. But this is going to be the uh, second possibility of directly restricting the choice of the child as opposed to messing with the preferences. Okay. So, so based on this uh, overall structure, you can now kind of link what's happening in this model to uh, parenting styles in the kind of development psychology way. So in particular, we're going to call uh, a permissive uh, parenting style, um, a parenting style where you essentially place no restrictions on the child. So the, the choice set is the maximum choice, choice set, and the preference you transmit is the uh, bliss point preference. So, so you don't distort the preferences from what makes child the happiest. Okay? So children have fun and they follow their own inclinations. We're going to call authoritarian any kind of style that, uh, or any kind of outcome that imposes a restriction on the uh, choice set. We're going to call a pure authoritarian style, where that's the only thing that you do. So you select the choice set, but you also set the preference to the, uh, to the bliss point. We're going to call authoritative a style where you uh, affect the choice of the child uh, through, uh, uh, through preferences. So, so we set A prime to something other than the bliss point. Uh, and in the model, you know, the only reason you would ever do that is to influence the choice of the child. And so, so this, this kind of means you are trying to uh, affect the outcome. Say again? I can tell you how old my children are, but... Uh. <laughs> they must be very young. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot affect the preference of children. You can affect choice sets. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So I think you're allowing yourself huge degrees of freedom by maximizing over A prime. Um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and that's the whole point. So uh, you know, a choice of the child is just a single thing, and it has no choice whatsoever. This thing will just drop out. And there will be no further influence on preferences. Why would, I, why would that be the case? Well, if you make a small change in your, as a parent in your behavior, mm -hmm. and the child responds to that in, in, in a way that causes you, that would cause you in anticipation to make a larger change. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean like some second order thing, not. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Second order or second order. I mean, just yeah. mm -hmm. with the timing consistency issues, you often lose the differentiability. Yeah. Well, so this is, you know, this is just telling you, uh, assuming this uh, first order condition does characterize the optimum, this is what it, what it looks like. Uh, I, I think it's easier to talk about those in particular examples. So the examples we have done wouldn't have that problem. 
Uh, but this is very general, so you know, all kinds of things could happen in principle. Of course, it's also going to be a function of uh, how big this derivative is, you know, the, the, the derivative of my utility with respect to the choice of the child. You know, if, uh, if we had the same utility, right, if uh, uo was equal to uy and a' was equal to a, then this derivative is, is going to be equal to zero because of the envelope uh, uh, condition. You know, then, then the optimizing child of the uh, uh, choice of the child would also set uh, the derivative of my utility with respect to the choice equal to zero, and that would draw away. Okay, so, the, so the extent to which paternalism matters depends on uh, disagreement, uh, how much uh, do we disagree about what's, what's the right thing to do, and uh, freedom of choice. So the more the child can choose, the more this thing is going to be important. So this lambda comes from where? Is this, uh, this is just a parameter. You know? So uh, you, you, could, you could, in principle, also think about those being transmitted. Uh, today, I'm just going to think of this as some, some fixed number. But in principle, lambda could depend on A itself, right? Yes. Hmm? Bitcoin would have more like a lambda. Right. Yeah. Hmm? No, you, you could, in principle, also think of, of lambda being uh, something that's, that's, that's transmitted. We, we didn't find it so kind of uh, essential for getting the basic trade off, so we left it constant for here. It's certainly something you could do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is it not derivative of u0 respect to a? Oh, because the a here is, uh, is fixed. That's my own preferences, because I look uh, uh, at what the child does with my own eyes. Hmm? Yeah, hmm? right. So that's already a fixed number at this point. Okay, so that, this, is the, uh, this is the choice of this uh, preference parameter. Uh, of course, there's the uh, second dimension, which is, which is the choice of the choice set. Okay, so, uh, so the uh, parent can also choose the set from which the uh, child uh, chooses, and it does uh, kind of some maximizing way. Now, of course, if, this, um, uh, if by choosing this uh, choice that you had kind of complete unrestricted choice, and you could simply pick your uh, preferred um, your, your, your bliss point, then you would just do that and you would be done with, with everything. But, but the, the idea is going to be that there might be some, uh, uh, some trade-offs uh, uh, kind of in the set of the feasible uh, uh, choice sets. Okay? So by, uh, by restricting the choice set of the child, you might make it more difficult for the child, for example, to, to react to uh, future changes. Okay? And uh, we're going to make this a bit more explicit in a second what this is going to look like. But this is going to be the uh, second possibility of directly restricting the choice of the child as opposed to messing with the preferences. Okay. So, so based on this uh, overall structure, you can now kind of link what's happening in this model to uh, parenting styles in the kind of development psychology way. So in particular, we're going to call uh, a permissive uh, parenting style, um, a parenting style where you essentially place no restrictions on the child. So the, the choice set is the maximum choice, choice set, and the preference you transmit is the uh, bliss point preference. So, so you don't distort the preferences from what makes child the happiest. Okay. So children have fun and they follow their own inclinations. We're going to call authoritarian any kind of style that, uh, or any kind of outcome that imposes a restriction on the uh, choice set. We're going to call a pure authoritarian style where that's the only thing that you do. So you select the choice set, but you also set the preference to the, uh, to the bliss point. We're going to call authoritative a style where you uh, affect the choice of the child uh, through, uh, uh, through preferences. So, so we set A prime to something other than the bliss point. Uh, and in the model, you know, the only reason you would ever do that is to influence the choice of the child. And so, so this, this kind of means you are trying to uh, affect the outcome. Are. Say again? I do not know how old your children are. But you really I can tell you how old my children are, but... Uh. <laughs> they must be very young. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot affect the preference of children. You can affect choice sets. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So I think you're allowing yourself huge degrees of freedom by maximizing over a prime. Um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and that's the whole point. So, uh, you know, it depends what you mean by preferences. You know, I, so you can affect, you can, can, example of soccer is very attractive. I guess. You I mean, cannot, you cannot, you cannot. I mean, I, uh, you, better, you better follow my team, or you know, or what? Yeah. You know, something bad can happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something bad can happen. Okay, but, but taking it seriously, the point is that uh, uh, kids, when they so, so let me, let me be, be concrete. You, you, need, you need credible strategies here, mm -hmm. right? And you need to, uh, to worry about outside options. So, of course, if you've got a five-year-old, you know, you tell them, you know, if you, if you don't eat this, I will not give it to eat tonight, and the child might actually even believe that. But when they are 15, they just go to fridge on their own. So, so okay, so um, and, uh, you know, let, me, let me tell you what we have in mind. Or, or more seriously, they walk out of the house. Let me tell you what we have in mind. So, so I'm going to... There, there, mm -hmm. You know, there is a, there's a conflict here. Yeah. And... Um, Choice sets, and I think that's a brilliant idea, you know, thinking of, of how you restrict the choice set, but also taking into account that the child can respond uh, okay. in ways that are not desirable. 
Okay, let me just maybe, so in a second, well, actually in two slides I will come to particular examples and I'll tell you more specifically how we, how we talk about this. There is the issue of child development, which of course is extremely pertinent as the first three, five years. Right. That's mm -hmm. when you can really affect preferences, but uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not so sure how you capture that in, in that moment. And then, from then on, I think you've got a phase where, you know, you're setting budget constraints, you're setting choices and so on, and you've got a different personality there. So I think that's what you need to capture. Okay, so I'll come back to this in just one second. I just want to uh, flash by one slide. Just, just to say that uh, uh, so far we had a model where there was only, the only state variable was the preferences, but of course you can extend this with additional state variables, some economic state variables such as assets, savings, and so on. But, but uh, I'll just get out of the way. So that, uh, what we're going to talk about is, is an example to patients. So let me answer your question by t telling you more specifically how we think about this question. Can, can I answer this question first and then go to the next one? Thank you. Uh, just, just one after the other. So, so you're asking about, uh, you know, can you really influence preferences? So, um, of course, it depends a bit what you mean by, by preference. You know, when we think of patients, uh, we think of this really as something that uh, uh, determines kind of your um, kind of long-run path in life. So when, when, when I say patients, I do, I do not mean uh, kind of the uh, marshmallow experiment, you know, eating something in five seconds or, or, 20, uh, or two minutes from now. I think about uh, the value that you place on things that happen 10 or 20 years from now in terms of your current decisions. Now, for example, the, questions, uh, the question, how much education am I going to get? Do I want to uh, go to uh, college and, uh, you know, graduate school and then become a doctor or a lawyer? Or do I rather want to drop out of school right now so I can make some uh, income right now and uh, have more immediate consumption? So, so, so my vision is of this, that uh, in, uh, in families that uh, impose a lot of patience on their kids, what they do is they uh, tell them from a young age that education is very important, they kind of uh, uh, you know, form that whole life path for them and kind of form this expectation that, that this is what you have to do, kind of uh, look for the future and, uh, and work hard and get education, as opposed to uh, families where this doesn't happen. And so, so, uh, so these, uh, these thoughts that education are important, that you have to kind of take this long route to success, uh, never really comes to uh, a children's mind. Now, it's a question if you want to think of this as a, a skill or a preference, but this is kind of what we have in mind, and this is, this is a way to model this. So I guess you had the next question. Well, certainly, uh, you know, education, uh, is, uh, income is highly correlated across generations. Yeah. Education, uh, savings choices are correlated across, yeah. you know. Okay, so um, so what? So I mean, that's something you're after too, I guess. But but what I want to do, to do uh, what I want to emphasize today with this particular example is to think about uh, under which conditions are you going to adopt which parenting style, and then we're going to, to link that link that to evidence. But but uh, you know, certainly things such as uh, persistence in education, uh, uh, savings behavior, those are things that are correlated across generations that we could measure. But but, but uh, today it's, it's going to be more about the kind of broader question of uh, kind of what features of the economic environment will. Will adopt you, will make you adopt a particular parenting style. Okay. But, but yes, uh, there was another. So, when you were talking in that, whatever the last slide was, before you mm -hmm. moved away, it, it looked like it didn't, was it authoritarian or authoritative? Both picked the A lower bar for the future. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that partly a result of the fact that you don't care about what's going on with your kid once you're dead? Because when mm -hmm. I think about trying to form my daughter's preference, Right. Uh, part of why I'm doing it isn't so much that she does what I want her to do now when she's living with me, but it's yeah. because I think it's going to be helpful when she becomes an adult on her own, and that would be that do thing that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know if that yeah. So, so it depends a bit on. Uh, so, so. Uh, so in this application, we have a mind. Uh, we think of this uh, a uh, playing a role, say, kind of, you know, when you're. Uh, like from your uh, teens to your to your twenties, you know, when you kind of make these big decisions about uh, getting education or uh, you know 
uh, parting through entire 20s. That's a thing when well, we have a mind for this application. This would certainly be a lot later than, than right now for the child. You know, so so think, of, uh, think of young adult being adolescence to young adulthood, and then the other stuff comes, comes after that. Mm -hmm. um, yes? Mm -hmm. So the X, uh, right, so, the, so in principle, the A gets passed on, although in the example I will do, there will, will be no persistence whatsoever. So neither the A nor the X will have long-term consequences. So how, how do you distinguish? Okay, so, yes. Cost to impose, uh, so, so I think it would probably be useful if, if, if I talk a bit about this example, because this will make, uh, this is kind of designed to make things a bit more clear in terms of, you know, a particular thing that we have in mind, okay? And then we can come back to these questions. Okay, so, so that, that was kind of the general vision of uh, how kind of choice sets and, uh, and these preferences are determined. So I, I now want to show you kind of a very simple uh, example of this, which, which I, I do think is kind of informative for uh, what you can do with this ultimately empirically uh, and so on. So we're going to have uh, patience as the uh, preference parameter. There's going to be some notion of occupational choice on the, on the choice set side. And we're going to come to this in a second. Okay, so, so this A will now correspond to patience. In what way? Well, there's going to be some uh, standard CR utility function. So for the old guys, it's just going to be C to the 1 minus sigma, where 1 minus sigma. Uh, we're going to keep uh, sigma between 0 and 1 to have uh, utility be positive here. So if you actually like your children in that sense. Uh, and the children's felicity will look like this. So, so they have the same CI utility function, but they have this weight psi minus a in front of this. So what does this mean? The psi is a number bigger than 1. And this uh, captures the degree to which uh, children uh, appreciate the present, uh, the present more than, the adult, than, than their parents would like them to. Okay? So think of uh, psi being, uh, being 2. So that means that, uh, that the... Uh, a child has kind of a large desire for current consumption than uh, what the parent uh, thinks is, uh, is optimal. You know, and, and think of this as affecting your investment, for example, in education in your, in your 20s. Now, the way the A comes in, the A is the choice of the parent. Uh, the A uh, is essentially a way to lower this appreciation of, uh, of this young age utility for the child. Okay? So, uh, so think of A as something as uh, imposing these feelings of guilt and terror on the children by, by saying, no, if you don't study hard, bad things will happen to you. You will end up in a penury. Maybe you know, some uh, higher being will, uh, will punish you. So you impose these negative feelings on the child that lower the uh, enjoyment of this young age period and therefore indulgently make the child appreciate the future relatively more. Okay? And this is kind of a stark example because here the only thing you can do to, to your a uh, child is, is lower the child's utility, which of course you would never do for altruistic reasons, but you might still want to do this for the paternalistic reason of moving the choice towards your preferred direction. Okay. So, uh, so that is, uh, that's kind of the uh, structure of the preferences here. So psi is bigger than 1, meaning the, uh, there's this conflict between uh, how much uh, value you should place on the present versus the future. Um, and then this uh, A is a choice. Of course, you can set uh, A prime equal to psi minus 1. Uh, in which case this, would, uh, this thing would just be equal to 1. Uh, so then the child would do exactly what you want the child to do. But of course, there's a cost because you have to really you know, push uh, the utility down of the, of the child to, uh, uh, to appreciate that. You could, in principle, also set A prime equal to 0. Uh, then there's maximum disagreement, but at least the child is happy, so there's some, some upside uh, to that too. Okay, so that, that's the, uh, that's the uh, preference side of this uh, example. OK, and so now uh, the occupational choice. So there's many possible um, occupations uh, I. Um, and uh, there is some, some randomness to the return of these occupations. Could be a high return, a high return or a, a low return. And uh, a particular feature of this is that there is some, uh, some incumbency advantage. So, so, so the idea is that uh, if you uh, adopt the same, um, the same occupation that your uh, parent has, uh, then the return goes up by a factor of, of, uh, of mu. So what we're trying to capture here is that there might be, um, uh, so, so, uh, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way. There's going to be here a conflict between uh, keeping control of your child and letting the child go. Letting the child go will allow the child to make the optimal occupational choice relative to uh, the child's talent. But um, by, uh, by keeping the child uh, in, your, in your own occupation, uh, you will have uh, control. So, so, so you can uh, define a narrow choice where you can tell the child 
uh, what to do. Now, um, whether or not that's, that's, a, that's a good thing will depend to some extent on this uh, incumbency advantage. The idea is that there might be a society that's kind of rigid and has low mobility, where there might be a kind of rents to being in a particular occupation already. So your father's in the guild, uh, you know, 200 years ago, and there's a higher return to being there. Then, there's a, then it's kind of a good idea to keep the child in the same occupation. Or if there's some transmission of skills already uh, during childhood, then you also would expect uh, Mu to be kind of a larger number. As opposed to modern society that kind of has high mobility, where there's kind of le uh, relatively less advanced to doing the same things that your, that your parent do. Okay, so this is the occupational choice. There's also going to be effort. And this effort you can think of, uh, you know, kind of how hard you study or how much, you, uh, how much time you spend on educating yourself. And this is kind of the thing that's going to, we have, we're going to have a, a conflict of interest over. So the child can exert some effort E uh, when young and it gets some return uh, RE uh, when old. And you can think of R, this return to effort, is also something that could, in principle, vary kind of across time, across space, or maybe also across you know, different groups of, uh, of families. OK. So, uh, so now, um, uh, in terms of the choice, there's two things you can, you can do. You can either uh, force your child to stay at home with you, or you can grant the child uh, independence. So if you uh, force the child to stay at home, uh, that's going to give you uh, full control over the child. So, so there is no longer any question of what uh, effort the uh, child will put on, because you can, uh, you can decide that uh, for the child. Um, the, the downside is that then the child is uh, forced to adopt your occupation, and, uh, and it's uncertain how productive the child is going to be at this. So, so the return that you're going to get, the mean return, is the, the average of the high and the low return uh, times the uh, incumbency premium mu. If you let your child go, so, so the idea is you know, the child leaves town, goes to the, uh, leaves your house, goes to the big city, goes to the university, then uh, the child can uh, choose optimally what kind of occupation it, uh, it wants to enter. Uh, so it can uh, choose one where it has the higher return. So you get YH uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, the child, uh, because it's not out of your control, can choose uh, effort independently. Okay? So you have potentially a higher return, but you also have uh, this problem that you have no, no, no longer the direct control over what your child is uh, is doing. OK, so let's, uh, let's uh, spell out what um, this decision problem looks like um, first uh, for the independent child. Okay, so here, the uh, child is allowed to, uh, to uh, move, uh, move away. The value function of the adult, so this part is the um, income of the uh, uh, old adult and then the utility from the children. And uh, here's the utility from the child. It depends only on a prime because there's no uh, other state variable here. And we do this uh, uh, conditional on the child being independent. So the choice that is also uh, unrestricted. Okay, so here we are uh, simply uh, uh, plugging everything in. So, so the, uh, um, the element that you have is the, uh, the altruistic component. So there you place the weight of psi minus a prime on the uh, young age uh, utility of the child. And so if you now increase a prime, that will uh, also have some negative impact for you because you suffer a little bit for the misery that you impose on the child. Then you have the paternalistic element where you uh, evaluate the uh, utility of the child through your own eyes. And then you have the uh, future utility of the child. And this, uh, and this choice of uh, effort uh, because the child is independent is made uh, by the child. So, so the weighting here are the actual preferences of the child. So the uh, uh, psi minus a prime shows up in here. So it's, it's, uh, it's done by the child, but of course, if you, uh, if you increase a prime, so if you, uh, if, if you kind of uh, shape the preference of the child to be more future-oriented, then the child will put in more efforts. And so you can, uh, you can have some impact on the, the effort here by, uh, by, by investing in these uh, preferences. OK, so now, um, so in the... Uh, in, uh, in this regime where you are uh, giving the child independence, uh, you've already given up on the authoritarian style. Uh, so, so the only choice that remains is between authoritative parenting, meaning you uh, shape the preference of the child to make it uh, put in more effort, or permissive parenting uh, where, you, where you don't do that. And you can write down a first order condition for a prime for this model. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes this form. So there is uh, a marginal cost. And the marginal cost is essentially proportional to the consumption of the child because it's, it's this utility from uh, young age consumption. And so this marginal cost is uh, weighted by your, uh, by your weight on altruism uh, 1 minus lambda. And there's a marginal benefit that is uh, over here. So this marginal benefit uh, comes from the change in consumption from uh, changing the preferences uh, of the child. 
So if you, uh, if you uh, increase A prime, CY will go down. You like that because you uh, wanted to save more for the future. And the weight of that depends on your degree of paternalism, but also on the extent of the disagreement. So this psi minus A prime minus 1, that's the gap in this uh, weight and young age utility between parent and child, and that tells you how strong this, uh, this motive is. Okay. So what are you going to do? Well, it's going to be uh, you know, obvious uh, in the extreme cases. If lambda is 0, meaning you are uh, completely um, uh, altruistic, then uh, this thing here uh, is gone, and the only thing that you have is a marginal uh, cost of making the child unhappy. So you don't want to do it. You said a prime equals to zero, meaning the bliss point. You know? So if, you, if, uh, if you're fully altruistic, there's no reason to, uh, uh, to impose feelings of guilt on your child. If you're fully paternalistic, so if you uh, don't directly care about the utility of your child, just about the outcome, then uh, it goes the other way. You want to uh, set a prime equals to psi minus one, so to get the child to do exactly what you want the child to do. So these are the uh, two extreme cases. Then, of course, the interesting cases are uh, uh, in between. So if you're in between, the optimal parenting style is going to be a function of, uh, of R, so this, uh, this return uh, to effort. Okay? So even if you disagree with the child, but R is a, is a very small number, then the, uh, then the gain for your utility from making the kid you know, study harder, work harder, isn't very large. Okay? So in a, in, kind of a, in kind of a low return uh, society, you don't really uh, want to uh, uh, you know, work too hard on the preference of your child, and so you're more likely to uh, adopt uh, a permissive parenting style. But if R gets large, if, uh, if the stakes are much higher, uh, then, then you do want to be uh, authoritative, and increasingly so as R goes up. Okay? So, so this, uh, this R essentially kind of measures uh, how important it is for the child, or how important it is to you for the child to do the same thing um, as you. Yes, yes hmm? Um, no, so, so they are um, authoritarian or authoritative? No, so so uh, permissive uh, means you, you don't, you, you give complete uh, freedom, so this you do if you're completely altruistic, and the authoritative uh, you do if you're uh, paternalistic. If you're in between, then, then you can be either depending on uh, how, you know, what, what, what the stakes are. Um, okay, so, so uh, the, the other option that you have is to keep your child at home. So this is this uh, uh, option that gives you a complete uh, uh, control. If the child is at home, then uh, you choose the E directly, so you're authoritarian, and that means there's no longer uh, any, uh, any, any benefit from molding the preferences. You know, the only reason you ever want to mold the preferences is to affect the choice of the child, so therefore you said A prime equal to zero uh, in this case. You never do both at the, at the same time. When do you want to be uh, authoritarian? Well, it's, it's uh, the function of the mu. So if this uh, incumbency premium is large, you're more likely to, uh, uh, to, uh, to want to um, uh, keep full control over the child. But uh, you, know, you have to weigh kind of this uh, premium against the loss from the imperfect match. So if there's a, um, if there's a society where there's a, a little benefit from doing the same thing as uh, your parent does, and there's a, a much larger benefit from kind of choosing your talents uh, freely, then you're more likely to let the child go and therefore use one of these other styles. Okay, so, so uh, we can summarize this by with a few pictures of the uh, equilibrium uh, parenting style. And uh, we sort of did this, uh, they don't have labels yet, but I'll just tell you what's happening here. This is a picture of uh, mu versus uh, r. So this is the uh, incumbency premium, and this is uh, the return on, uh, on effort. So if you have um, uh, somebody with lambda equals zero, so you're completely um, altruistic, you just want to make your, uh, parent, uh, your child as happy as possible, and so there's gonna be a zone over here on this side, you're going to keep the child at home simply because the incumbency premium is so large, it's going to be optimal for the child to be there. Uh, and if the mu is larger than, than uh, over here, then you're going to be uh, permissive. So then you let the child go to do uh, its, uh, its own thing. So there's no, uh, there's no intervention here unless it's uh, optimal for the child to stay, stay home. If you uh, increase the lambda, then uh, this line is going to be uh, curving a little bit to the left. So what is happening is here that uh, if you're at a point somewhere here, now where you now switch from uh, previously permissive to now authoritarian, that over here the, uh, the mean return is larger from, uh, from staying at home, so the incumbency premium isn't large enough to make that uh, dominant, but at the same time, given that the R is now large, um, uh, staying, keeping the child at home gives you control over the effort of the child. Okay, and so, uh, so by keeping the child home, even though there's a, there's a, a downside in terms of the immediate return, you can make the, the child work hard, and therefore you have a, an incentive to be authoritarian. So the, 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 kind of this range 
of authoritarian parenting uh, initially increases if, uh, if the lambda goes up. If the lambda goes up even further, at some point then you have uh, a zone of uh, uh, authoritative parenting. So, so what's happening here? We have now here the zone where you have um, authoritarian parenting, so high incumbency premium, and so um, you want to keep the child at home. Uh, down here, where the uh, premium is low, but also the return to effort is low, uh, you might as well let the child uh, go free and, uh, uh, and be uh, permissive. But over here, where there's uh, not much benefit to incumbency, but the returns are high, this is where you want to be authoritative. Okay, so these would be uh, the situations where you would expect uh, parents to not impose direct restrictions, but kind of work uh, harder on the preferences uh, in order to, uh, to get the child to do something closer to what you would have uh, chosen for the child. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is kind of the uh, general mapping from the economic environment into what uh, parents would do. And of course, if you go, um, if you go higher, then this uh, authoritative zone will, uh, will expand. At the limit where lambda is equal to 1, you once again have just two zones, like, uh, like at the beginning, uh, with the difference that now uh, this zone is completely authoritative. Okay, so, so the decision only depends, uh, again, on the, on the mu. But here, rather than be permissive, you set um, the uh, a prime to psi minus 1. So you make the child do exactly what you want uh, by, um, by giving uh, the child the same preferences that you have. OK, so that's, uh, that's uh, roughly what this looks like. Uh, okay, now uh, people have been talking about data. Now we, have, we don't have much to say about this, but um, uh, you know, so this is now a more speculative part. But I want to tell you at least a little bit how we think about uh, how this might relate to uh, some change over time and some differences across countries. So, um, so if you look at um, if you look at the United States, for example, other Western countries, uh, what I think that we have is uh, uh, over time evolution from a fair amount of uh, authoritarian parenting to uh, something uh, more permissive over time, but ultimately uh, also more authoritative. So our kind of broad vision is that in 1900, we were over here, uh, where uh, you're in a world where there's um, uh, a high premium to incumbency could be because of market imperfections or just because you learn a lot uh, at home. So there isn't really that much gain for giving freedom to your kids. And, uh, and for that reason, being authoritarian kind of uh, makes sense in this environment. But keeping the child at home, uh, you can give the child both a high return and uh, keep control. Then uh, over time, you know, Pink Floyd, uh, our vision would be that Pink Floyd uh, kind of uh, outcomes uh, happen uh, when these uh, incumbency advantages kind of go down. So, uh, so forcing your child uh, to be kind of around you the whole time is not, no longer a good idea. But at the same time, the stakes uh, aren't all that high. And so if the R is low, um, if, uh, if it's really not that important for the child to work very hard, um, then, uh, then there isn't really that much gain to work very hard on the preference of the child. So you go towards something that's relatively more permissive. And of course, if there's changes, you know, if there's differences across families, it would be. Uh, uh, yeah, hmm? What pieces of data allow you to compare So, um, so we think one measure of this is, for example, inequality. If you're if you're in a in a in a country or a time where inequality is very low, if no matter what you do, you get paid the same amount, the stakes are low. So there isn't really that much. Um, uh, uh, it's really that, not that important for the child to do the right thing, and that allows you to be more permissive. You know? And so, so we think of this as kind of also being uh, uh, kind of consistent with the uh, fall in equality that we have seen in industrialized societies, at least until the 1970s or so. You know? where, where, you know, I don't know, in Germany, if you uh, went to university or you worked with Volkswagen as an industrial worker, the wage is pretty much the same, so, so the, the stakes are relatively low. But then we think that uh, what happened since then is that the uh, stakes have uh, gone up again because now you know, we have uh, this uh, increase in inequality at all levels, much higher returns to education. So uh, getting the child to do the right thing becomes kind of a, a more important thing. And so, so we think of this as kind of broadly tracking the uh, trends in inequality over time. And the general idea is that, uh, you know, that, you, uh, that you kind of want to be more uh, aggressive if the stakes are high. It's kind of similar to, I guess, uh, Jeremy and Jesus' thing about uh, sexual morality. You know, if you have uh, uh, what you indoctrinate them about is uh, whether it's a bad idea to get pregnant. Well, it depends on whether being pregnant is a terrible thing or not. And so this what is kind of. Hmm? On, on a particular body of mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, no, it's, it's not that. I mean, we think of Lambda as something, uh, you know, one could think about this evolving in some form. But, but I, think, I, I think the more interesting thing is to think of this as something that's just as, as given. That's kind of you know, a human parameter. And, uh, and then think about how the economic environment changes. And one, one could think about this too. But I think we are more interested in, in the other. Mm-hmm. 
Say it again. Would they have any lesser empirical ground than you do? So I didn't didn't get the first proposition. Hmm? Any evidence that you know, those things that you the way with so you generously describe the history of the twentieth century as transparent, is there any evidence that that's indeed the case? Well, so um um I mean there's certainly documented change in equality. We also have uh, a few pick no. hmm? Absolutely, a everything is refutable. No, so uh, parenting style is something that's uh, that's absolutely measurable. You know, so things, for example, like a corporal punishment is, is measured, and we can we can see what it looks like in the data. Uh, I also have uh, some uh, pictures here on uh, on uh, inequality. So 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 you have these uh, uh, you know value surveys where you ask people you know what is kind of an important value to instill in your in your kids, and that that's also uh, measurable. Of, of course, these things aren't kind of as easily measurable as capital or or income, but I don't really think that the uh, uh, kind of conceptual uh, refutability of this is kind of any uh, any kind of problem. Now, we, we see very clearly that uh, that the authoritarian style has uh, declined over time, and uh, you know this was a previous slide which I won't have time to talk about. But we've also seen uh, more recently, for example, this much uh, larger time investment by parents uh, in educating their kids. You know, which is oh, it's already zero. Okay, so um, uh, so what I was uh, so this this uh, this mention. Uh, what this is, this is uh, inequality across countries, uh, uh, together with um, some uh, data from the World Value Survey on, on what kind of values are important to instill in your, uh, in your kids. And what you see is that in uh, countries that have higher inequality, you see kind of a less, uh, uh, less uh, emphasis on uh, imagination, uh, less emphasis on uh, independence, because so something else will kind of go together with this more. Uh, this So I have, I have something to say, but, but I don't have time to talk about innovation. So I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that for the for discussion. There's also a hard work. So if you look at uh, uh, at uh, the relation between uh, emphasizing hard work and uh, inequality, it's the high inequality countries, in particular China, where emphasizing hard work to your kids is super important. It's the uh, you know Sweden, Norway, and so on, where there's no inequality, where that's not really being very very much emphasized. So it's a certain thing that you, that you can find uh, uh, evidence that there's. Uh, that there is a relationship between the economic environment uh, in a given country and what kind of values parents uh, want to emphasize. Of course, this is cross country. The more uh, kind of interesting thing, or more you know, the richer data, is the micro data. So the next thing that we're looking at is um, data sets like NSY, where you have uh, parenting style variables, and you can link that to occupational choices, inequality, you know, all kinds of things uh, over time. But I'm uh, more than out of time. So. Um, so what we have is, uh, is, is a model of preference transmission that combines altruistic and paternalistic motives. What it gets you is a theory of parenting styles and kind of uh, allows you to relate these economic theories to, uh, to the whole literature in uh, de development psychology on parenting styles. And uh, next step to do is to explore empirical uh, predictions. Ultimately, you know, I didn't have time to talk about this. Of course, it also makes you think about how uh, policy choices, for example, you know, the, the design of the school system uh, interact with uh, parenting and then uh, long-term outcomes. But I'm uh, out of time, so I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much.